Hi, I'm Dr. Henry Black from New York University School of Medicine and president of the American Society of Hypertension. Today I want to get you into a little secret that is the, the designation of prehypertension. When we were putting together the stratification and classification system in the 7th Joint National Committee report, the um, director of the National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute, Claude L'Enfant, told us who were writing that, that our prior systems were much too complicated. We had seven different categories of, of hypertension, and he said quite appropriately that people simply didn't work with something so complicated as that. We had to make it easier. So we decided to modify our previous stratification system. We made everybody who was under 120 or under 80 as having normal blood pressure, people from 120 to 139 or 80 to 89 as having prehypertension, from 140 to 159 stage 1, which was the same as JNC6, and everybody over 160 and or over 100 was called stage 2. Now, prehypertension was a designation that we, we in, invoked that changed what had been normal blood pressure and high normal blood pressure. High normal blood pressure was 130 to 139 or 85 to 89, and that just didn't seem to work. All our providers and our patients heard was normal. They didn't hear high. So we very deliberately try to get people's attention by coining this term. It turns out that the pediatricians had done this in the 1970s, but it never really took, took hold. And the diabetologists had called people prediabetes for many, many years, and then they changed this to impaired glucose tolerance. Well, prehypertension worked. There were articles all over the place in the lay press. What right did we have to tell people they were prehypertension? They had prehypertension. After all, we're all pre-dead, right? True. But the idea was, and I think it was successful, that this would be a behavioral trick that would get people to, to pay attention. We had no evidence at that point that treating prehypertension was going to be an effective thing, uh, and we made no recommendations at all other than lifestyle modification as to how to treat it. Well, since 2003, much has happened. The most recent epidemiological study that I want to call to your attention comes from CARDIA. CARDIA was a, a prospective evaluation, now into its 20th year, of people who were 18 to 30 when they started, about 5,000 individuals, about half African American, slightly, half, slightly more than half women, and these, these have been followed serially over the years. At the 15-year mark and at the 20-year mark, they did electron beam computerized tomography to look for coronary calcification. Turned out that about 600 odd of those cardiac volunteers developed prehypertension during that time period. And those who did had significantly higher calcium scores than those who didn't, confirming the risk that we had uh, assumed would be the case as blood pressure rose. In fact, if we're going to do anything about the cardiovascular epidemic, we better deal with people who are not hypertensive yet. Because once you have an elevated blood pressure in the office or elsewhere, you already have damaged blood vessels and you're already at risk. Now, there have been two drug trials that have looked at this as well. One called Trophy that was published in 2006 using candesartan in a single dose, 16 milligrams, and more recently a trial called Faro which used ramipril in five milligrams. The ramipril study was three years long. The, tr the trophy study was a little more complicated at two years of active therapy and then switched to placebo for another two years. The findings were almost identical. Treatment with a, a drug that was either an ACE inhibitor or an angiotensin receptor blocker definitely prevented the development of new hypertension. Now, some people have said, big deal, you're just treating them. You're not really changing the physiology or the pathophysiology. I don't care. If we actually can begin to reduce blood pressure in individuals who don't qualify for active therapy yet, whether it's with lifestyle modification or with drugs, that's fine with me. Down the road, we can assume, and I think correctly so, that we're going to have fewer heart attacks to deal with, fewer strokes to deal with, less renal failure, and less early mortality. Thank you very much. I'm Dr. Henry Black from the New York University School of Medicine 
and president of the American Society of Hypertension.